Howdy, it's Kyle talking about Pennsylvania. In this video, I'll be going over various aspects of the geography of the state. I'll be talking about the cities and the urban landscape. I'll be going over the physical geography to include the general scenery, protected areas, climate, and natural disasters. I'll be going over economic indicators to include the industries that drive the economy, companies that are headquartered in the state, tax rates, and agriculture. And I'll also be going over various aspects of the culture of the state. So if you're interested in learning more about the Keystone State, this is the video for you. Pennsylvania sits in the northeastern portion of the U.S. At the 2020 census, there was a population of just over 13 million people, which ranks at fifth in the country. The overall state has seen population growth since 2010, but just like many other states, most of the rural counties in the state have seen population decline, whereas most of the urban and suburban counties have seen population increase. Throughout the entirety of U.S. history, Pennsylvania has been ranked at least in the top six in terms of overall population, and right now it's number five. In terms of its size, Pennsylvania ranks 33rd in the U.S. in total area, and it's the only one of the original 13 colonies that doesn't have any coastline along the Atlantic Ocean. It was the second state to ratify the Constitution in 1787, and thus became the second state of the United States. The state capital is Harrisburg, has a population of only about 50,000 people, and there are about 593,000 people in the immediate Tri-County metro area. The city itself has seen some struggles lately. There's a 26% poverty rate and there's a very high crime rate. And it's interesting to note that Pennsylvania is the only state in the country in which its capital showed up in the top five for both my worst capital cities video and best state capital buildings video. There are some nice old houses on a walking path along the Susquehanna River right downtown. And there's a really cool pedestrian bridge that goes over the river to City Island Park, which is a little island which has walking and biking paths and ball fields. However, after sundown, downtown gets to be kind of a ghost town. There really isn't much going on in terms of an entertainment or nightlife district. So not one of my favorite capital cities, but a really beautiful capital building. The largest city in the state is Philadelphia, with a population of just over 1.6 million. There has been some decent growth in the city since 2010, and all of its suburban counties are growing as well. The overall metropolitan area has about 6.7 million people or so. And that's spread across southeastern Pennsylvania as well as southwestern New Jersey and northern Delaware. Of that 6.7 million people, approximately 4.2 million are in Pennsylvania itself. And the overall metro area ranks at about 8th in the U.S. Philadelphia has been one of the most important cities in the U.S. throughout the entire country's history. It was the temporary national capital in the late 18th century. And it was the second largest city in the country throughout the entire 19th century. In the year 1900, that census is when Chicago finally passed Philadelphia. It's home to Independence National Park, which is where you can see Independence Hall, the Liberty Bell, and a lot of other really beautiful buildings from the late 18th century. And the city is also home to the Museum of the American Revolution, so if you're interested in early American history, this is one of the best places to see it. The downtown is pretty good for walking around. It's referred to as the center city, but some of the most interesting neighborhoods are not right in the heart of the CBD. South Street is a major street just south of downtown. This is where you have a large cluster of bars and nightclubs, and it's probably where you have the biggest party-type atmosphere in the city. Right near downtown is a street called Pashyunk, and the East Pashyunk Corridor has a lot of really cool shops, a lot of local-oriented shopping and entertainment stuff. The formerly run-down part of town that's been gentrified recently is called Fishtown, and this is your hip and cool neighborhood, a lot of art galleries, great restaurants, and some music venues. But between South Street, East Passyunk, and Fishtown, Center City, Philadelphia is surrounded by some pretty cool neighborhoods. One thing I find very interesting about the city is that there are only four bridges in the whole city that cross the Delaware River. And there's a pretty funny bit by comedian Bill Burr talking about the lack of bridges in Philadelphia. But I think it's a great place, has a lot to offer if you're into big cities. The second biggest city in the state is Pittsburgh, with a population of about 303,000. It's the 68th largest city in the country, and the population is declining. The Pittsburgh metropolitan area has about 2.7 million people, ranked at about 25th or so in the U.S. And this metro area bucks the national trend in that most of the suburban counties of Pittsburgh are actually losing population as well. Just about everywhere else in the U.S., the suburban counties are gaining population. I've mentioned this before in a couple other videos, but Pittsburgh is one of my favorite big cities in the country. It has a really cool downtown, beautiful skyline, and the city is great for walking around. Because the city is so hilly and mountainous, and it really isn't that big, it's almost like a big collection of a bunch of small neighborhoods that all come together to form one big city. And even though there are only 300,000 people in the city, there are several really interesting neighborhoods within the city borders. In the heart of downtown is a neighborhood called the Strip District, 
And this has a really nice public market, some international restaurants, some cool shops and bars, and it's the prime nightlife area for the heart of downtown. The city is known for being the confluence of three rivers. It's where the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers come together to form the Ohio River. If you leave downtown to the south and cross the Monongahela River, you'll end up in the south side flats area. And this is a really cool, mostly locals type area, a lot of bars and restaurants there. And overall, this is kind of a really cool part of town. Another really cool and hip part of town is called Lawrenceville. And this is definitely off the beaten path for tourists. It's almost entirely locals hanging out in this part of town. Oakland is the part of town where you have two major universities, the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University. So as a result, there's a lot of college student oriented businesses there. Another really cool part of town for some local shops and restaurants is called Squirrel Hill. And this neighborhood is also pretty far off the beaten path for visitors. And the fact that there are these several really cool neighborhoods that are great for walking around that are all fairly close to each other, but they're separated by mountains is one of the reasons why I like the city so much. So not only is it great in terms of the compact size for walking distance, but also the hills make it very good for exercise. And to put the cherry on top as to why I like Pittsburgh so much is it's one of the cheapest big cities in the country in which to live. The next largest metro area in the state is the Allentown Bethlehem Easton metro area, usually referred to as the Lehigh Valley. And the overall Lehigh Valley metro area has a population of about 753,000 people. This is part of the Northeast Megalopolis and not really disconnected from Philadelphia suburbs much at all. All of the counties in this metro area have grown slightly since the 2010 census. However, the population growth has not been evenly distributed across the Lehigh Valley. Allentown is the third largest city in the state with about 126,000 people with a slight population increase. Of the three main cities in the Lehigh Valley, I would say Allentown is probably the roughest one. The downtown really wasn't very interesting. It doesn't really have one of those neighborhoods where it has some cool local boutique shops and entertainment options. East of Allentown is Bethlehem with about 76,000 people. Of the three main cities in the Lehigh Valley, I would say Bethlehem is the nicest one. It has higher income, lower poverty, and lower crime than Allentown. There is much more going on downtown, much more worthy of parking the car and walking around for a while. And it just offers more in terms of urban amenities than Allentown. Being home to the excellent Lehigh University certainly helps out Bethlehem a lot, and it provides the city with a nice anchor, especially after Bethlehem Steel went away. But what the city did with the old Bethlehem Steel plant was really cool. They turned it into an area called the Steel Stacks, and they just left up the old factory. It looks kind of cool. They got some walking paths going around there. There's a large lawn where they'll have outdoor concerts and festivals. So the city has done a pretty good job of taking what was an urban blight, making it a pretty cool spot to hang out. At the east end of this Lehigh Valley metro area is the city of Easton, which is right along the border with New Jersey. And this is definitely the smallest of the three major cities in the Lehigh Valley, only about 28,000 people there. It has more of a quaint type feel there, even though you are in a larger metro area right in the middle of the northeast megalopolis. The next largest population center in the state is the scranton wilkes bear metro area in the northeastern portion of the state. Scranton has about 76,000 people, and wilkes bear has about 45,000 people. The overall metro area has about 568,000 people. Scranton, the largest city in this metro area, is pretty rough. It has high poverty, there's a lot of really run-down type neighborhoods, and just a lot of empty buildings and storefronts. So here's a photo of a large empty building in Scranton. This is fairly common, but I'm standing in the exact same spot turning around. This big empty building is in the heart of downtown Scranton. It's not too common to see this big of an empty building right in the heart of the Central Business District. Just down the road from Scranton, connected by suburbs, is Wilkes-Barre, often pronounced Wilkes-Barre. And from what I understand, both pronunciations are acceptable. Just don't say wilkes Bar. This is a video that I shot while standing in the heart of downtown. This is a Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. This should be the busiest time of day. There is absolutely no activity whatsoever in this main intersection in the heart of downtown Wilkes-Barre. But I think it's really worth comparing the Lehigh Valley metro area, Allentown, Bethlehem, to Scranton, Wilkes-Barre. They're very similar in many ways, but the Lehigh Valley has seen many more improvements, and that seems like a much nicer place than the Scranton, Wilkes-Barre area. But to be fair, about halfway between Scranton and Wilkes-Barre is a suburb of Pittston. And this probably has the most interesting downtown for the whole metro area. It's halfway between the two bigger cities, has a pretty cool main street, some nice local boutiques and shops, and some really cool murals right there as well. So even though the two main anchor cities of this metro area are pretty rough, at least Piston in the middle is kind of cool. The next largest metro area in the state is Lancaster. There's about 59,000 people in the city and about 553,000 in Lancaster County. 
And in terms of where the city stands economically, Lancaster is closer to Bethlehem than it is to either Scranton or Allentown. It has a nice historic downtown, really cool for walking around, some great restaurants and cafes. You have a little more of a tourist economy there, as Lancaster is the heart of Amish country in the state. Pennsylvania has the largest Amish population of all states in the country, and Lancaster County is the county that has the largest Amish population. This has been one of the fastest growing counties in Pennsylvania, and you definitely get a sense of Lancaster being in a better economic situation than many of the other medium-sized cities in eastern Pennsylvania. The next largest metro in the state is York. There's about 44,000 people in the city and about 457,000 people in York County. And this city was very dichotomous. The downtown looks kind of cool. Some really old buildings, some cool shops, really interesting for walking up and down. But the rest of the city is really, really rough. There's a 32% poverty rate and there's a very high crime rate. Most of the city looked pretty run down, a lot of boarded up buildings, a lot of empty storefronts. But it did have at least that kind of interesting downtown that Scranton and Wilkes-Barre really didn't have. And it really is difficult to separate York from Harrisburg and Lancaster. It's almost one big large metro area. The next largest metro area in the state is Reading. The city has about 95,000 people and Berks County in which it lies has about 430,000 people. And Reading is much more like Allentown, Scranton, or Wilkes-Barre than it is Bethlehem or Lancaster. It has a pretty high poverty rate and a pretty high crime rate as well. There wasn't a whole lot going on downtown, and there really aren't any interesting neighborhoods in the city. However, directly adjacent to Reading is the suburb of West Reading, which is much more interesting. It's a much smaller town, but the main street has a lot more local shops and boutiques there. It just gives that type of urban feel that Reading really needs. Next in line is the city of Erie. There's about 94,000 people in the city and about 271,000 people in the county. And as you might expect, it sits right along the shore of Lake Erie. There's a little nub in northwestern Pennsylvania that extends out to Lake Erie, and that's where the city sits. About 20 years ago, I would have said Erie was just about the worst city in the state. However, the last time I was there, I was pleasantly surprised at some of the improvements in the city. It's still really poor and it's still losing population, but there have been some improvements in recent years. You've got some jobs coming to town, a few small high-tech startups. So it'll be pretty interesting to see in the coming years if Erie becomes kind of a hipster magnet. But based on where it was heading 20 to 25 years ago, it is nice to see some improvements in the city. And I want to just briefly mention a few other towns in the state. Altoona has a population of about 43,000 people. It's in a beautiful mountainous setting about an hour and a half east of Pittsburgh. It is probably most well known for being home to the Horseshoe Curve, which is a big railroad curve that goes around the mountain there. And this is a pretty popular tourist attraction for people that are into railroads and railroad history. Not too far from Altoona is the city of State College with about 41,000 people. And as the name would imply, it's home to the largest university in the state, Penn State University. One of my best friends grew up in State College and went to Penn State and we've hung out there many times. I think it's a great town. I think it's one of the great true college towns in the country. It really is just a huge university and a bunch of businesses designed for the students and faculty. Just east of State College is a town of Williamsport. This was once known as the lumber capital of the world. However, nowadays it's most well known for being the home to the Little League World Series. In the south central part of the state, not too far from the Maryland border, is the town of Gettysburg. And of course, Gettysburg is most well known for being the site of the major battle for the Civil War and also where President Abraham Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address. And the battlefield is now a national park. It's a really interesting sight to see. But of course, me being a geography buff much more than a history buff, I really like the scenery of this area and walking around the battlefield to seeing some of the gorgeous rolling hills and just kind of getting an idea of what the, the battlefield was like from a geography perspective. And the actual town of Gettysburg is pretty cool, nice historic downtown, some interesting shops and restaurants, but it is kind of touristy. And the last town that I wanted to mention is the town of Jim Thorpe in the Pocono Mountains. It's named after the American Olympic hero. And it's a really cool little town, great downtown for walking around, a lot of cool shops. It's very touristy, but it's also very nice and in a very gorgeous setting as well. With Pennsylvania having over 13 million people, there are way more towns to talk about than I can fit into this video, but there are a lot of other really cool little small towns and medium-sized towns in the state. Next, I'm going to get into some of the physical geography of the state. And when many folks think of Pennsylvania, the first thing they might think of are the cities and the industry. But it really is a beautiful state. It's almost entirely green, a lot of rolling hills and mountains, a lot of great rivers and other fresh water. So if you're thinking that Pennsylvania is just Rust Belt, think again. Pennsylvania is a very green state and much of it is also very mountainous. The Appalachian mountain range goes throughout most of the central and eastern portions of the state. 
Although the mountains are often referred to as the Alleghenies in some parts of the state, and they're usually referred to as the Poconos in the northeastern portion of the state. And although the state is fairly mountainous, the highest elevation at Mount Davis is only 3,213 feet. And it's located in the southwestern portion of the state, not too far from the Maryland border. There are no nature-oriented national parks in the state, but there are several national forests, national recreation areas, and many other state forests and state parks. The north-central portion of the state is where you're going to see the largest number of protected areas. There's quite a bit of wilderness in this part of the state, and it's often referred to as the Pennsylvania Wilds. This is where Allegheny National Forest is, as well as several state forests, including Susquehannock, Tioga, Loyal Sock, and many others. There aren't too many parts of the eastern U.S. where you're going to get true wilderness backcountry, but you are going to find some of this in north-central Pennsylvania in the PA Wilds. And there are also many state parks scattered all throughout the state as well. And there really is no shortage of wonderful areas you can get to out in nature outside of the big cities in Pennsylvania. Much of the underlying geology of Pennsylvania is part of what's called the Ridge and Valley Province. And this is where you have a large number of alternating ridges and valleys in the Appalachian Mountains system. And it does lead to some really cool scenery and some interesting driving as well. So you can easily see the ridges and valleys on this map. So imagine taking a back road driving across these ridges and valleys perpendicular to them. Most of the mountains in the state are comprised of limestone, which is easily soluble in water. And areas where you have a lot of limestone combined with a lot of precipitation like you do in Pennsylvania, you often get a lot of caves. And Pennsylvania is one of the top states in the country for caves and cave exploration. So the ridges and valleys and all the caves in the state are formed by water. And there's a lot of water in the state. Some of the major rivers in the state include the Delaware River. And this is the river that is the border with Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Along the Delaware River is the Delaware Water Gap National Recreational Area. And this is a very popular spot for some flat water recreation. And the Delaware River is the one that flows through Philadelphia as well. Another major river in the state is the Susquehanna. This goes roughly north to south through the state going through Wilkes-Barre and Harrisburg. And as I mentioned before, Pittsburgh is where you have the confluence of three major rivers in the western portion of the state. Downtown Pittsburgh at Point Park is where the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers come together to form the Ohio River. And the Ohio goes on to be one of the primary rivers in the eastern U.S. But rivers aren't the only freshwater that has impact on the geography of Pennsylvania. The northwestern corner of the state has a small shoreline along Lake Erie. And this is where the city of Erie is located. So between the major river systems of the state and the Lake Erie shoreline, Pennsylvania has great access to water. And Lake Erie also has an effect on the climate of the northwestern portion of the state. Being just downwind of one of the Great Lakes, you get a lot more lake effect snow in Erie and northwestern Pennsylvania. In terms of overall general climate, it tends to be fairly mild. Due to the mountainous terrain and ridges, you do have a fewer number of tornadoes and severe thunderstorms in the eastern two-thirds of the state. And although winters certainly do get pretty cold there, it's not as cold as you are going to get in the upper Midwest or in New England. And summers can be pretty hot and humid, but nothing like you're going to get down south. The state also fares pretty well in terms of natural disasters. With it not being along the coast, it's not going to take a direct hit from a hurricane. You do have a decent risk for tornadoes in the western quarter of the state, but most of Pennsylvania has a below average tornado vulnerability. And even with all the water in the state, flooding is not a huge concern for most of the state. However, there are a couple of spots where flooding has been a major concern throughout history. Most notably, the town of Johnstown in the western portion of the state has been hit with floods several times. Most famously, in 1889, was a huge flood that did tons of damage and killed over 2,000 people. But despite the major issues that Johnstown has faced due to flooding, the overall state does have a below average risk for natural disasters. So with beautiful scenery and protected areas, gorgeous mountains, lakes, and rivers, a mild climate, and a relatively low risk to natural disasters, the overall physical geography of Pennsylvania is pretty good. Next up are the economic indicators of the state. Historically, Pennsylvania has been most known for heavy industry, manufacturing, and coal mining, but in recent years, there's been a lot of economic diversification to the point where the economy is very well-rounded. So there's a lot of stuff going on that isn't just a blue-collar, heavy industry kind of stuff. So let's get into some of the money of the state. The GDP of the state is about $833 billion, which ranks it sixth in the U.S., the GDP per capita is about $64,000 per year, which ranks at 21st. The household income is approximately $70,000 per year, which ranks at 19th. And the poverty rate is about 12%, which ranks at 29th in the U.S. Historically and currently, the largest part of the economy in Pennsylvania is going to be with blue-collar type industries. 
Although the steel industry plays a smaller role in the overall state's economy, Pennsylvania is still one of the top five states in the country for steel production. The state also has a long history of being an important part in terms of the energy sector. The state ranks number two in terms of overall natural gas production in the U.S. EQT Corporation headquartered in the state is the largest producer of natural gas, and Pennsylvania as a state produces about 19% of all the natural gas in the U.S. It's also an important state in terms of coal production, and even though coal mining has decreased in recent years, Pennsylvania is still the number three state in the country for coal production. The state also has a notorious history with the nuclear power industry. Back in 1979, the Three Mile Island nuclear plant had a reactor meltdown, and this was a major disaster that led to about $2 billion in cleanup costs. It was finally cleaned up in 1993, but the nuclear power generation at the plant was being phased out, and the plant went into a state of permanent shutdown in 2019. Some of the largest companies headquartered in the state include Comcast, PNC Bank, First Commonwealth Bank, Vanguard Investments, Lincoln Financial, U.S. Steel, Rite Aid Pharmacies, Teleflex Medical Devices, Viatris Pharmaceuticals, GNC Nutrition, Air Gas Industrial and Medical Gases, PPG Paints and Coatings, Exalta Paints and Coatings, Arconic Lightweight and Metal Engineering, Alcoa Aluminum and Alloys, Wabtec Railroad Tech Motors and Automating, Vichy Semiconductors, EPAM Systems Software, Unisys IT, Aramark Food Service and Facilities, Hershey's Candies, Heinz Condiments, Wawa Convenience Stores, Sheets Convenience Stores, Dick Sporting Goods, American Eagle Outfitters, and Urban Outfitters. And there are many other companies in the state, but this is a pretty impressive list of companies headquartered in Pennsylvania. Agriculture is also an important part of the economy of Pennsylvania. The state ranks 22nd in terms of overall ag production in the U.S. It's famously number one in terms of mushrooms. Approximately half of all the culinary mushrooms consumed in the U.S. come from Pennsylvania. And these are mostly white and brown button mushrooms and portobellos. But it isn't just mushrooms. The state also ranks number four in apples. It ranks number four in Christmas tree production. And it ranks sixth in overall dairy with it being seventh in milk. So not the largest number of agricultural products coming out of the state, but what it is known for, it's pretty big in. Tourism also plays a major role in the state's economy. One of the big parts of the state for tourism is South Centralish Pennsylvania. About 20 minutes or so east of Harrisburg is the town of Hershey. And this town is the headquarters of Hershey's Candies, but it's also home to the amusement park, Hershey Park. I've never been there, but I know it's popular. I know people that have an annual pass to it. Also in this same general part of the state is the town of Gettysburg. And this is a popular destination for people that are into American history, specifically Civil War history. And you could easily spend an entire day just walking around the battlefield. And also in this same generalist part of the state is the heart of Amish country. A lot of folks visit the region to buy Amish arts and crafts as well as food. Or just stand around like a looky-loo and take pictures of people. I think that's kind of strange, but it's a popular thing to do. The Poconos in the northeastern portion of the state is also a popular tourist destination. There's a lot of resorts and lodges in some of these small towns. And in the wintertime, you can escape to the Poconos and do a little bit of skiing. So between manufacturing, energy, finance, communications, tourism, and agriculture, the economy of the state is pretty diversified. In terms of tax rates, Pennsylvania has a 3% flat state income tax. And that's one of the lowest state income tax rates of the states that do have a state income tax. Sales tax is also below average at about 6.3%. So income tax and sales tax pretty low, but the property taxes are above average. And the gas taxes are really high, some of the highest in the country. But because the income tax and sales tax rates are fairly low, the overall tax burden in the state is pretty average. Now I want to get into some of the signature foods of Pennsylvania. Many of the most iconic foods in the state have an origin with the Amish community, one of which is Scrapple. And this is essentially just random pig parts formed into a meatloaf. Sounds pretty strange, looks pretty strange, has a strange name, but don't ask, just eat it. Something else coming from the Amish community is Lebanon bologna. And this is a smoked, fermented, and cured bologna. I'm not sure all the nuances that go into making this different than a regular kind of salami or bologna, but it's really good. And a dessert originating from the Amish community is shoe fly pie. This is a really thick, super sweet molasses pie. It's way too sweet for my taste, but a lot of folks love it. Perhaps the most well-known food to come out of Pennsylvania is the cheesesteak. And this is a hoagie roll with meat, cheese, peppers, onions. 
and how it's dressed will be a little bit different depending on where you get it from. Usually the cheese will either be provolone or cheese whiz. And I love cheesesteaks. There are all kinds of places throughout town where you can get good ones. And it isn't really food, but I think it is worth mentioning that Yingling Brewery is the oldest currently operating brewery in the U.S. It started brewing beer in 1829 and today is the largest completely American-owned brewery in the U.S. You can get Yingling all throughout the country now, I think, but there was a time when you could just go into a bar in Pennsylvania and simply order a lager and they'd give you a Yingling. And the last thing that I wanted to mention about Pennsylvania are some of the sports fans. Philadelphia sports fans are notorious for being some of the worst fans in the country. Some of the worst hecklers and booers. And probably no one's more upset with YouTube taking down the dislike button than people from Philly. It takes away their ability to smash that boo button. So that's my overview of Pennsylvania. It's a very well-rounded state, has some great cities, some really nice small towns, beautiful scenery, gorgeous mountains. Winters don't get horrifyingly cold, has a relatively low cost of living, diversified economy, and the tax rates are average, so it has pretty much something for everybody. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve. And if you're interested in stuff like this, subscribe to this channel. I'm talking about cities and counties and states and ranking them and comparing them in all kinds of different categories, talking about cross-country road tripping, and everything I talk about comes from a little more nerdy type perspective. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out.